Hey everyone, this is Philip of Hoopwork. Um, coming to you today with a topic about the, um, the fact that all of us have enough faith and have enough, not necessarily faith, we have enough evidence to believe that God exists. Um, I have been hearing that um, quite a few times now with people that I've had conversations with, um, you know, if God would show me this miraculous sign, then, you know, I'll believe in him. And um, I'm about to detail with you from the word of God, how God has done that for each and every one of us. Those who have um, not, uh, those who have come to the faith, you know, you guys can comment down in the uh, comment section and just detail, like, how did God reveal to you himself? Um, and how did he, um, how did you see other people come to Christ, especially those who are, you know, you're close to, family members, other friends. Um, we will see that there's like a nice trend that God is very intentional about uh, him showing himself to us. Um, so yeah, um, I'd like to start first with prayer and then we will jump right into it. Uh, Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you, Father, that you are here and that your word is truth, Lord, that we can see jesus that from the beginning of time that you set the plan of salvation in motion um so, uh, even before we uh, disobeyed you and ate the fruit uh from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil we know Lord jesus that you uh, did come into this world and that at the end you're going to come back for your children lord to reveal yourself ultimately to us lord uh, as the king that you are and we thank you jesus in jesus name we pray amen uh, so I'd like to just start first with, um, um, like, there's going to be an order to this, uh, and then at the end we'll we'll, we'll summarize everything together. And uh, and, and uh, again, I'd like to hear you guys' thoughts on this, and uh, and you can uh, again comment and also share this, share this with the person that you believe is on that uh, truth quest or has posed that question to you. Uh, if God would show me this or that sign, I would believe in him. So I think the first thing that God has done to reveal himself to us is that uh, he's shown himself through the universe and everything that he has created. Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, qual yeah, um, yeah, qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse right so this verse is basically saying that god has revealed himself to each and every one of us first through everything that has been made right uh, his eternal power and divine nature right his eternal power the universe is beautiful if you guys have done like just a study or uh, just um search up videos of like how big is the universe or what's in the universe or like how um uh intense the universe is it is ridiculous um and so god is saying like okay that you see how powerful the universe is uh the sun you can't get close and right we are in the like they call the goldilocks zone where it's just right that you we can see examples of what happens if we're too close we have venus what happens if we're too, if we're too far we have mars right life cannot inhabit or exist outside of where the earth is right now um and so it's amazing right that eternal power and this divine nature right we look at nature and we see wow this is beautiful this is intricate we look at ourselves the psalmist david says we are fearfully and wonderfully made um when we look at ourselves and like the cells that we have the the way that our our heart, uh, the heart is actually one of my favorite organs because when I was studying it in biology in high school, it was, the teacher was showing us just how, how designed it is, right? You know, you have blood that has oxygen and blood that does not have oxygen has carbon dioxide and how they just like in the heart, they're flowing with precision. Like everything has to be that way so that blood doesn't mix, so that oxygen doesn't, um, or, uh, uh, carbon dioxide doesn't get back into your body right like it's, the intricacies is just beautiful and that's what god's saying when we look at the, the, the heavens when we look at the earth and everything that's in it when we look at ourselves 
And when we look at the micro um, uh, organisms and the, the micro universe, that is all done, right? That's pointing toward a designer, a maker. Um, another point that uh, the psalmist pushes in uh, Psalm uh, 19, verse 1 to 2, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. Um, here, I'm actually going to link a video where um, a, a famous apologist, uh, Frank Turk, actually explains, um, I guess, even the, the first part, Romans 1.20, where it says, uh, God's divine nature and his eternal power are made and revealed through what has been made. I'm going to link a video. And um, it will basically explain this, uh, an atheist who was uh, debating, does God exist? Can we extrapolate our universe, um, the idea of the universe being created to, uh, and you know, pointing it to a designer? Um, are those synonymous? And, and Frank really does help um, bring the atheist's objections, his questions, and gives them an answer. So I'll link that um, at the bottom of this video. <clears throat> the second thing that I believe that testifies about God and his is um, showing us that he exists, giving us evidence that he exists, is our consciousness, right? Uh, Romans two fourteen to 16 says, Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature what the law requires, they are law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. Uh, well, Paul is, Paul is the writer of Romans. What he's saying here is that the uh, the Gentiles themselves are um, us, right? We're not. There's in the Bible we're classified as uh, Jews and Gentiles. Jews are uh, you know the people of Israel. Gentiles are everyone else. And basically, what Paul is saying is, uh, the Jews got the law of God, the Ten Commandments, and then the the other six hundred and three laws. Um, you know, dietary, clothing, ceremonial, all those laws, and so. What Paul is saying is like, the Gentiles, us, we never got the law, right? It was for the Jews. And when we have, you know, in our hearts, no pieces of the law without having it, you know, the way it was presented through Moses to the Jews, when we have it, and we can testify that, wait, lying is wrong, adultery is wrong, um, uh, you know, dishonoring our parents or elderly is wrong, um, coveting the neighbor, our neighbor's stuff is wrong, jealousy is wrong. Like when we see, wow, oh, and and you know, um, creating some form of God that is, you know, not ultimate, right? When we when we make money an idol, when we make things an idol, when we at least have a hint that something is not right, that this we know is not the ultimate. And that there's something above us saying this is what we we ought to do, right? We can do whatever we want, but there's something that's higher than us, and that's what Paul is saying here. The Gentiles that are um, they don't have the law by nature do what the law requires, right? They are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. That's what God's saying. I've given you a conscience, is what He actually calls it. Uh, the, the first commandment that uh, God gave people was in the Garden of Eden, right? He says, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When you do, you're going to die, right? Uh, he was saying spiritually you're going to die, but he also meant physically we are going to die. Um, it's kind of interesting because God actually planted two important trees in the Garden. He planted the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. He, the only tree he said don't eat from is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So Adam and Eve, our first parents, could have eaten and did probably eat from the tree of life. When they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and they brought the curse of uh, the world, right? decay, evil, death upon themselves, God put a cherubim, which is a form of an angel, and a flaming sword to protect the tree of life so that no one would touch it. And that was a gift, by the way, right? Death is a gift to us as humans. And the reason why it's a gift, this is not my idea. This is an idea from a uh, singer, uh, Stephanie Gretzinger. When she was studying the book of Genesis and you know how all that went down, God revealed this to her that death is a gift because 
when you think about it, the, the, the decay of our world is very nasty, right? Emotionally, physically. Imagine having to live forever in this state of brokenness. So God allowed the earth and our bodies to receive the curse of death so that we can have a divine a re a restart, right? A potential restart. If you trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this is not the end of, um, of seeing God's goodness in our world, right? We experience God's goodness through the rain, through we're able to have you know, healthy bodies, we're able to enjoy beautiful things and stuff like that. Um, this is not the end, right? But for those who do not trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, this is the best heaven you will ever get. Because you are basically saying, God, I don't want you now. And if I don't want you now, I will not want you in eternity. So I want to not be with you. And so God will give you that pearl of life, right? He will give you up to your own um, um, desires. If you don't want him, you will not be with him. That's fine. Uh, that just means you will not receive the goodness of God in the land uh, of the dead, of the afterlife. <clears throat> right? In the land of the dead is not really the land of the dead in the Christian um, uh, narrative. It's just the stepping off point into eternity to be with God if you have trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Um, so the Ten Commandments, uh, they're actually repeated. In the New Testament, nine of them are repeated in the New Testament. The only one that's not really repeated is uh, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, right? Um, the Sabbath for the Jews is on Saturday. And we as Christians, typically we meet on Sundays. So, uh, you know, that 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 one specific law does not uh, apply to us. But all of the other ones, they, they do apply to us in the summarization of the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love. Uh, joy, Galatians 5 says this, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Self-control, by the way, is, I believe, the only self term that the Bible really affirms. Um, most of us, you know, we have self-esteem, we have self-love, we have, you know, all of this centeredness. Um, I believe self-control and love your neighbor as yourself and, you know, what you would have yourself do, do to your neighbor, those, I believe, are the only ones. They're always outward-looking. Even though they're self, they're always outward-looking, like, this is how I'm to behave um, and this is how I'm to treat my neighbor um, for the sake of this law of love being fulfilled uh, in the world and in my own personal life. Um, and so this is still Romans 2, verse 15, though. Uh, Since they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, their consciences, uh, consciences also bearing witness and their thoughts either accusing or defending them. This will come to pass on, the, on that day when God will judge men's secrets through Christ Jesus as proclaimed by my gospel, right? Jesus is going to come and give to us what our deeds deserve, right? Did we put our trust in him or did we put our trust, excuse me, in ourselves? Um, and so that's what Paul is saying. Our consciousness will testify whether we either accuse us or defend us. Like, do we know that we're doing something that's right or do we know that we're doing something that is wrong, right? Our conscience, God has given us so that we can navigate life. You will get the full picture when God reveals it to you through Jesus Christ, right? Um, as he pointed out, like, uh, through the gospel, it, it is everything's fulfilled through this gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, so yeah, so we have creation, we have um, the law being written on our hearts. Those are the two uh, uh, how God has revealed Himself to us, uh, and the third one is uh, where we are born. Right um, in Acts seventeen twenty six to twenty eight. Uh, for from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands god did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he is not far from any one of us for in him we live and move and have our being 
as some of uh, your own poets have said, we are his offspring. This actually answers the question of, you know, what if, uh, you know, the person in the tribes of Africa that has never heard the name of Jesus Christ, will it, um, how, how about them? Like, how is God going to give them the gospel? Um, and Paul, Paul is basically saying, like, no, right? God has given them the first two, right? He's given them the creation and he's given them their conscience and where they are at physically in this world is very strategic and when they were born is very strategic in uh, pointing them toward God and saying, okay, a God exists. I need to find out for sure. And God uh, will then reach out toward them, right? Uh, God's word says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. And basically he's uh, telling us that um, because he he wants us to make that realization no or uh, concrete in our own lives, right? When we draw near to God and we say, yes, there is a God that exists, he will begin to show himself more to us. Um, and this is like love, right? God is the definition of love. And we know that love is something by definition that has to be freely given. You cannot force anyone to love you. That's just, you know, coercion. Um, so when God begins to show himself like a man trying to court a woman, right, he'll present himself to her. He'll make his intentions known to her uh, through you know, verbal or just through signals. The woman will uh, notice them. And then she has the proverb, do I say yes? to these advances or do I say no to these advances? And that's what God's doing. He's wooing our hearts. And when we say yes, he's going to reveal more of himself, right? You begin to build that intimacy with him. Um, and if you say no, he'll, he'll you know, stay at a certain level of wooing. He may be, become more extravagant in how he reveals himself, trying to show you. But if you are not getting it, he will not force you to love him and accept him, right? He will just leave you to your your will um and so you know some of the other ways that god does that is through dreams right he will give you dreams that reveal himself uh to you right uh, we know this from when jesus was born the magi who were not like jewish people um at all um they came to worship jesus they followed the star and the star uh, uh presented itself at the house of jesus um and uh what is it so again heavens declaring the glory of god they found jesus they worship him as a king uh herod who was the king at that time uh wants to uh, you know worship jesus quote unquote and he tells the magi when they come to him to look for jesus um like you know uh, when you find him tell me where he is and i'll go worship him in a dream the magi are warned by an angel do not go back because he wants to kill jesus so they leave right so god when he wants to get his message across he will send whatever means dreams angels right to the shepherds um uh he's very intentional that he wants you to get it and he wants you to take those steps that are necessary to pursue him and he says when you seek me with all your heart you will find him you will find him seek and you shall find knock and the door will be opened ask and you shall receive god's very faithful to that because he does not he, he does not want any to perish but all to come to repentance as peter said um so why do people not believe uh i believe this is uh answered so so far we found ourselves in romans 1 20 we found ourselves in romans 2 14 uh, to 16, I believe it was. Um, yes, 14 to 16. And then now uh, we went to Acts 17, 26 to 28. Why do people not believe? I believe Romans 1, 18 to 32 answers this question, right? So we read Romans 1, 20, which says, for since the creation of the world, uh, God's invisible quali qual yeah, qualities, his uh, eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. 
Now if we go back to 18, let's see what Paul says. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. This is very important. Paul is asserting, so this is his beautiful assertion, he's about to qualify it with tons of evidence. People suppress that God exists because of their wickedness. If they believe and know God as the truth, right? They suppress the truth. Their wickedness will be revealed as just that wickedness, right? And people don't want their deeds being exposed to the light. No one does, right? We, we have secrets for a reason, those deep, dark secrets. If everyone knew, uh, we would be exposed and shame comes with that. And all of this other stuff comes with that. Verse 19, since, we, um, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them, right? God has made the universe plain, right? No one can say, even if you were blind or deaf or whatever, your conscience is there and you can see and you can experience the world however you can at that point. And we still, you know, we look at people who overcome adversity uh, through uh, uh, their, um, what is it, their ailments, through their uh, debilitations and whatnot. We look at that and we, as people who are fully, almost basically fully functioning, we say, wow, that is amazing, right? Like this person was able to overcome this with just the little that they have been left with. And you're like, wow, and that's what God's trying to show. Like he has made it plain to everyone that this world has a God. This world has a God. And verse 20 says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible uh, qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Verse 21. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but they but um, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human uh, being and birds and animals and reptiles. Basically saying, we have the, God, the truth of God, but we have made our own God. We have made them in the fashion of the things that have been created in this world. Back then, you know, it was physical, like they made human idols, they made uh, reptiles, and you know, that's why so many of these uh, mythological um, uh, belief systems have uh, things that are created in this world as their idols, right? They have people with heads of animals, and they have just all of these things that are created, right? And so... That's what God's saying. We have said these things that we have imagined in our minds and created with physical objects, we are saying these are our gods. The things that we have created, by the way, right? Uh, which doesn't make sense, right? <laughs> because a created God is an idol. Um, God is eternal. He is uncreated. And because he's uncreated, um, everything that exists is because he has created it. Uh, created gods are idols. Um, verse 24, Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degradation, uh, sorry, the degre degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Basically, when you say and you make gods out of your own image, um, that transpires into how you live and express your life, right? Uh, no longer do you have to tell the truth. No longer do you have to uh, live a tight life. Uh, and also no longer are the boundaries that God has placed applicable in your life, right? This becomes a relative, right? You exchange the truth about God for a lie. Relative, right? Lies are relative. And so that also extends into sexuality, 
right? That's why we have this sexual revolution, as it were, uh, having sex with whomever that we want, or having emotions for whomever we want, because we have we don't want to accept the boundaries of God. Sex is one of the highest forms of pleasure that the human can experience, uh, and God intentionally designed it that way. But He didn't uh, He didn't give us the opportunity to express it however that we want. He has boundaries even for sex, and when you exchange God's truth for a lie. Anything goes with sex, right? As we're about to explain, uh, uh, see in verse 26. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. Uh, the, the, let me read the previous part. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. When God gives you the desires of your heart that are not His, it is not freedom, it's judgment. As we're actually going to learn, it is not freedom. It is judgment, right? How many times whenever your parents have told you, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, and they tell you, fine, you're not listening, go ahead and do it, and then you do it, and then bam, your world comes crashing down. That wasn't mercy or, or um, freedom for you. That was judgment to show you your actions are going to lead you down this path. We've already tried to warn you that these actions are going to not farewell but because you don't want to listen experience the consequences for yourself trust me i'm speaking to myself there are many things in my life right i did a video on porn how i was um what is it i was addicted to it for uh you know up to now a good portion of my life uh or not porn lust let's say uh porn came and manifested itself later on in life but regardless that was me saying god i don't want your definitions of sex for me I'm going to define them for myself and if you know I whatever consequences let them come right and the consequences are not fun trust me they are they are not fun the to me the thing that really sticks out to me is the emotional toil that really takes on you your your mind is warped when you add porn to the mix your emotions are you know tainted no longer can you love a person purely because they are have more qualities than just their body you have to reduce them to that a body in order for you to uh, you know, glean some sort of pleasure from them and you know how many times have you especially women have been reduced to a piece of meat how does that feel right and or a man you have been used by a woman uh, for the things that you can give her instead of yourself, right? Not fun. Um, verse 20, uh, oh, verse uh, 27. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty of their error. Um, homosexuality god is very firm he does not consider it love it is lust right he says um and we're inflamed with lust for one another that is not love homosexual um attraction is not love god again being the definition of love right um his he he is the definition of love so he is going to say this is what love is Anything outside of that is lust, right? That's why adultery is wrong. That's why polyamorous relationships are wrong. Because God has defined a man, a woman, in the covenant of marriage, you can have as much sex as you desire, and also, you know, with reason, do not make it an idol. Um, and, uh, what was it? And do not add anyone else. Those are the rules, right? Man, woman, get married, have sex. Um, we have decided to taint that, right? Uh, even the even their women exchange natural relations uh, for unnatural ones, so women with women, and then it explains men with men. Homosexual uh, behavior is not love; it is lust. Um, but again, God is not con uh, He's not how do I phrase it? The people, right? He's separating that. He's separating okay their actions. 
versus the people. He still loves the people. He does not approve of their actions. Just like with lying, the uh, theft, greed, as we're gonna explain later, the people, he, he separates the two. He says, okay, their deeds are evil. I love them, but not their deeds, right? Uh, that's why he sent Jesus, because Jesus is the, the wrath of God's, uh, the, he, he took on the wrath of God for the things that we did ourselves. And so, <clears throat> oh, that's, sorry, that's my, <laughs> that's my computer. Um, yeah, so let's, let's continue. Uh, furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, this is verse 28, uh, so God gave them over to the a depraved mind so that they uh, do what ought not to be done, right? So this is the same. If God gives you up to your own desires, it's not freedom. It's judgment. Uh, they have become uh, filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, god-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. It's a nice long list of sins. And if, if it weren't enough, Paul adds, they invent ways of doing evil, right? So just to cover everything, just to make sure that everything is done. Basically, Paul is saying, the reason why we don't want God is because we know, as he points out, when we do such things, death is the penalty right there's a severe penalty we know that there's a severe penalty it is death for um uh, doing these things and if we acknowledge that we're agreeing with that that that's what we deserve so we say no i don't want to i don't think that's something that i deserve i don't want it so i'm just going to ignore the origin of where the decree comes from which is god i am going to be my own god If we admit that God exists, that means we are not God. Basically, to summarize that, uh, it is not a place that we want to be. Because what God is saying is this. If we reject him, he will give us up to our own devices and to the consequences of our own choices, right? God gives us choice, but he does not give us the freedom to choose the consequences of our choices. Uh, Ravi Zacharias, uh, a famous apologist, actually summarized it that way. You can do whatever you want, but remember there's always a choice, a cost for doing whatever you want. And if you ultimately do that, you're saying that I am my own God. And the, the penalty for doing that is death. And the way God defines death in Romans 6.23 is it's, it's a wage. It's what you deserve. Um, and death is eternal separation from God. And God doesn't want this for us, right? But he's love. He lets you do whatever you desire. He wants you to want him, right? That's why he's given you creation, your conscience, and where you were born as just a few things to say, yes, I, you know, God's saying, I exist. I want to love you, I want to reveal myself to you, and I want you to accept me. Um, there's this one thing that's separating us, which is the sins that you want to do, right? The shameful lusts, the lying, the gossip, the depraved mind. You have to let go of that and say yes to me, because God is pure. His divine nature is pure. It cannot coexist with these things. And ultimately, God promises to eradicate evil from this world, to restart the world, right? Death is a, um, is a gift for, uh, to us. The world will ultimately pass away. And God is going to restart with the people who want to be with him. And that's what God wants for you right now. He wants you to say, yes, God, I want to be with you now. 
that if you want to be with him now, he will let you be with him in the future. If you don't want to be with him now, you will continue to not be with him in the future. And the hope that God says is in Romans 10, 9 through 10. If we declare, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. That's as simple as it is. You acknowledge that uh, Jesus is the Lord of my life, right? And you acknowledge that um, he died on the cross for my sins, right? He came into this world to pay for my sin. He took on the wage that is death. And he's now saying, if you believe these two things and you profess that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. And when you are saved, you are justified and that your faith is confirmed through you saying it. And once that happens, you can be with God because he has said he has taken your sin away because he's paid for it. Um, as far as the east is from the west. And now you can have life with God right now before you hit eternity. And then after that, your goal is to share this gospel with everyone that you see or everyone that God leads you to uh, share that gospel with. Uh, that is through right now, right? Speaking it orally or uh, through your life, right? Love, joy, peace, the fruit of the Spirit. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I shouldn't even say or, it's and, right? You are sharing the gospel, right? Uh, go into the world and preach the gospel uh, to, um, uh, or make disciples, not preach the gospel, but make disciples of all nations, right? I'm telling you, once you begin this life, Jesus says he's going to... Um, Give you an abundant life and that simply means your life will count right it won't just count as oh you know i contributed something to this world it's going to count in terms of god's plan for eternity right that began before the foundations of the world jesus was destined to come die for our sins and uh, save us god was going to reveal himself ultimately through Jesus. And through Jesus, that's where all of this hangs. Right? The gospel is where all of this hangs. And that's all he's asking. Accept Jesus and you will be saved. You will have a new life, an abundant life that will matter in this life and also into all of eternity. As God brings all of this to a close, right? We're, we're in that end time series, in that end, you know, the um, the culmination of life is coming to a head and it's coming to a point where God is going to come back and he's going to restart everything. So yeah, I hope this makes sense. Um, if you guys have any questions, go ahead and post them in the comments. Uh, go ahead and subscribe if you have not. I would duly appreciate that. Um, for more teachings just like this, more words from God just like this, um, uh, go ahead and like the video and share this with other people because you know people you know people who have had these questions of if God has you know wants to reveal himself to me he will and he'll do it this way right and this is evidence that you know God has already done that he's doing that right now and he's just waiting for us our response will we say yes to him and no to ourselves let's pray Father, we thank you for today. We thank you, Jesus, that you are with us, that you are for us, Lord. We know, Holy Spirit, that you're speaking right now to the hearts of men, that you're speaking to our consciences, and you're saying, God, that we are, we are nothing without you, that there's nothing we could build, muster up, create, that can supersede you who is the ultimate of ultimates. We pray, Jesus, that you will uh, just come and attack our, our hearts. Destroy and remove, just like a doctor removes cancer, 
remove the cancer of sin for our, from our lives, Lord. When we say, God, it's there. The cancer is there. And you are the only surgeon that can come and take it away from us. We know, Lord Jesus, that you came into this world to live the life that we could not live, but die the death that we deserved. But you offer us, in exchange for our cancer, a new life, a new heart that wants and desires the things of God. And you promise us, Lord, that you're going to give us an abundant life. Whatever that looks like, Lord, we say yes to it. Um, and we say, Jesus, that you can be the Lord of our life, Lord. Because ultimately, Lord, you're coming back. You will be ultimate. You will be Lord. So we bow our knee right now. And we say, Jesus, come into our hearts. Bring your Holy Spirit to, to live with us and to guide us into all truth. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you.